everyone. Good evening and welcome to Q&A. Thanks, everyone. I'm Virginia Trioli and here to answer your questions tonight. The former member for Bennelong, now Professor of Enterprise at Melbourne University, Maxine McHugh. The Minister for Health and Sport, Greg Hunt. BuzzFeed Press Gallery journalist, Alice Workman. The Foreign Affairs Editor of The Australian, Greg Sheridan. And the Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Anthony Albanese. Please welcome our panel. Across Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio at 9 pm Eastern Daylight Saving Time. And you can stream us around the world on YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. Now, it's been a long, exhausting year in politics on all sides, capped off, of course, with an unexpected by election. So let's go straight to our first question. It comes from Francesco Baresi. Good evening. The Coalition has had a difficult 2017, but with the legalisation of same sex marriage, recent polling improvements, the Labor Party now marred by dual citizenship issues and the restoration of the government's majority through John Alexander's victory in Bennelong, is Malcolm Turnbull's luck finally beginning to change? I think we'll go straight to the press gallery for that one. Alice Workman. Well, I thought I was here tonight to explain memes to you all, but maybe I'll, I'll stick with the, we can do that the political analysis first. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that Malcolm Turnbull's been a bit of a Stephen Bradbury this year. I think that he, um, <laughs> you know, he's been behind in news poll for, for most of the year. There's been a lot of internal squabbling, but then out of nowhere, Bill Shorten really face-planted with Sam Dastyarian, having to send uh, two people off to the High Court, and then, you know, same-sex marriage came through. They won New England, they won Bennelong, and Bennelong was a little bit like a, a, an early Christmas present for the Prime Minister because it means he doesn't lose his one seat majority. It means that, you know, for now the leadership speculation probably will stop for maybe a few months, Greg, I don't know. Uh, and, you yes. know, the, the backbenchers who uh, have been really driving the political agenda of the government, much to, you know, the Prime Minister's uh, probably annoyance, might have to shut up for a few months. So I think that, yeah, he does end up the year as a winner, but more of a Stephen Bradbury, I'd say, than a Cathy Freeman. <laughs> Greg Sheridan. Well, look, uh, I couldn't really uh, disagree with any part of that analysis, but I'd say that, uh, look, you know, Turnbull and Shorten are very good blokes, and we're a fortunate country to have people of that quality as our alternative leaders, but you can't really see any circumstances in which the Turnbull government is re-elected. The structural factors are so heavily against them. Two terms of coalition government then will seem like a thousand years. They've got a majority of one seat. They're, they're rejoicing at their current success while they're behind in the two-party preferred poll, 53 to 47. I think Malcolm Turnbull's just lost his the, 25th news poll on the trot, Yeah, hasn't they've he? been behind for 12 months. And all the structural problems, although I'm an admirer of Turnbull, but I'd say he hasn't addressed any of the structural problems on his own side. He hasn't brought his troops together. Uh, you know, it was very dumb not to bring Abbott back into the Cabinet after the election. Um, he hasn't made peace with the conservative element of his coalition. They're the only people who are going to go out and fight for him. And as a government, it doesn't fight for anything. You know, it's sort of, it has a technocratic managerial sort of air to it, which it doesn't do terribly well. But you can't say, it doesn't get in the ring and fight, but you can't win unless you fight. Then you also can't win if you don't have any policy to fight for. And I think that one of the biggest things that Malcolm Turnbull needs to do in the next year, which potentially could be his last year as Prime Minister, which put it out there, is decide whether he's going to lead or be led by his backbench. And I'd really like to see the Prime Minister at the start of the year come out and say, this is my agenda for the year, because at the moment, I frankly don't know what it is. Let's uh, hear from everyone on the panel on this question. Maxine, we'll go to you next. Uh, well, I noticed that um, John Alexander, when he claimed victory again, and congratulations, John, on Saturday night, said that this was Malcolm Turnbull's renaissance. And I thought, well, that's an interesting term, because we know that the Renaissance came after the Dark Ages, <laughs> which suggests that he was a little bit unhappy with his boss. So um, this is yet another opportunity for Malcolm Turnbull, and he's missed many opportunities over the last year, really since the last election. Uh, I'm hoping that, in fact, he comes back next year and does the unfinished business of this parliament, and that is to clean up the show. A couple of weeks ago, for all sorts of opportunistic reasons, but something I actually support, he decided to ban foreign political donations. Big tick from me, but it's only a little part of the job. The rest of it is to have full-on, comprehensive campaign finance reform. 
not just about the money that you get from the Chinese, but the money you get from the corporates, the money you get from unions, everyone. We need caps on donations, we need on-time disclosure, and while we're doing all that, let's have a look at all of those committee reports that suggest we need some kind of integrity commission yep. in Canberra. Now, well, Greg, I know there are plenty of people on your side. Who have, worked, yeah. who have worked hard on endless Senate committees and joint committees. The Labor Party is almost there on a Maxine, lot of that we, agenda. We are going to come to That's this what later we need. We've got to clean up the show before okay. we get to the reform. We have a question on this, so we'll hold the rest of that until then. Um, but I'll go on to Anthony Albanese now. Are you now all those nameless guys who fell over before Stephen Bradbury got the gold medal? <laughs> well, uh, the, the problem for Malcolm Turnbull has been that he had a plan to get rid of Tony Abbott. But once he sees the Prime Ministership, I think that Australians breathed a great sense of, of relief. It was like the uh, days of conflict and, and uh, partisan politics were going to move on. He spoke about, on this show, he used this show as a platform to speak about treating the Australian population like adults. And uh, what we've seen, though, is, is no agenda, no sense of purpose, so that We've seen drift on areas like energy policy, climate change, something that I believe Malcolm Turnbull believes in. We've had a clean energy target established by the chief scientist and then rejected. We still don't have any policy at the end of this year. There was nothing new in it in my EFO. Can I, can I just get you to return to the question, which is about whether his luck has changed, and it would seem uh, to the questioner and to others that it has, well, he's and, on... and that, that your fortunes have changed in the opposite direction? Well, the polls haven't changed one bit. Today's news poll shows 53 to 47. Uh, what that would indicate, the consistency of the polls, which have been either 54, 46 or 53, 47 for a long period of time, uh, would indicate that a lot of people have made up their mind. I think they, they would like him, that they're, they're, they're willing him on to success, uh, but it it's not happening and I can't see any real change in the ground, on the ground. And the fact that you have this uh, tremendous victory in a seat that was held by the coalition by 60%, that's been held once because we had a fantastic candidate, Maxine McHugh, in 2007, you, once. It's the only time that we've won okay. federally. So the fact that that's seen as such a significant win I think indicates a very poor base from which Malcolm Turnbull's operating. Well, we'll, we'll go to you, um, Greg Hunt, on that particular question, but, but I think Anthony Albanese um, and um, Greg Sheridan make a good point, which is on the, the, the only poll that, that counts and the polls that we have at the moment, the fortunes aren't that good. Look, I'd uh, respectfully disagree. I'm very optimistic. I'm optimistic about the, the finish of the year. Uh, I'm optimistic about next year and, most importantly, coming off the back of the... Uh, mid-year budget update figures today, I'm deeply optimistic about the country. Uh, a thousand people are getting a job each day. Uh, we have uh, a closing of the, uh, the budget deficit, so we'll be in surplus uh, by $10 billion shortly. Uh, we will be driving growth, which is about investment, and that's new opportunities for new businesses, for, for young people who want to start. Uh, you have an economic plan, community development and health plan, a long-term national health plan. Tomorrow we'll be announcing uh, new breakthrough treatments in the uh, rare cancer space, an environment plan, an infrastructure plan, and incredible work on a national security plan. And so uh, I remain deeply optimistic. Yes, about the end of the year, the things that have been outlined, whether it was the incredible, incredible result in the uh, same-sex marriage plebiscite and the, the extraordinary moment of acceptance of, uh, uh, of gay Australians. I think this was the moment in 30 and 40 years' time when people will look back at the government. Okay. But, Greg, wouldn't you say that was the people's victory? Uh, absolutely. We put a vote to the people and the people voted. And uh, I was one who believed in the vote because I believed in the, in the right of everybody to have a say, yes or no. And I'm delighted at the outcome, but even more delighted that every Australian's had their part to play. But all of those are the political things. The deep substantive thing is Australians getting jobs uh, and the continued growth and the fact that this all comes from a very clear set of plans. And then in my own, own space, the fact that we are able to 
list new medicines for, uh, for cancer, for uh, conditions such as heart disease, for Crohn's Again, again we're, we're, going really to come, we're going to come to some of, those, some of those issues. That, We've got some medical questions. That's why, you. at the end of the day, okay. Uh, I remain deeply optimistic about the future. All right, let's move on to our next question from politics to policy. Our next question comes from Kathleen, Kathleen Ng. Coming from a public sector workplace where there is mandatory reporting for gifts over $50 to ensure there is no perceived actual or potential conflict of interest, the public is concerned about undue influence of political donations. Isn't it time, um, China may be the subject of debate at the moment, but isn't it time to go back to basics to review and restrict um, funding from both domestic and foreign sources? We had a little bit of commentary on this just before from Maxime McHugh, but Greg Sheridan, I'll come to you first of all. Well, I'm increasingly attracted to the idea of uh, greater public funding for political parties, and I don't think there's a simpler mechanism than based on the votes they got. They got it the last election. Be tremendously um, unpopular, of course. Yeah, and well, I'm an Irishman. We we live for unpopular causes, you know. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but I look forward look, to you going into politics, uh, Richard. Uh, yeah, I, I, you'd be the only one. <laughs> but uh, look, on the Chinese question, though, this has been a bit trivialised. Uh, it's been a, a bad week or two in that both sides of politics have trivialised this a bit. There's nothing, there's nothing Chinese about it in the sense of ethnic Chinese. There is something about the People's Republic of China. Can I stop you there? We actually do have a question specifically okay. on this, and I don't want you to stray into that beforehand. Can I just get you back to the question of restricting funding from domestic and foreign sources? I mean, the funding actually being tightened up in this, in this country. You started out saying it should be all public. You're saying all public, no donations. I, no, I wouldn't say all public. I, I'm increasingly attracted to more public. But, of course, you can't drive money out of politics. What you then get is third party... Uh, campaign organisations like Get Up and so on. They, they tend to be more on the centre left and the far left than they are on the centre right. So there's a bit of a structural disadvantage for the Liberal and National parties there. But they will then, I mean, money, political activist money, will find its way into politics. You're not going to stop the trade unions from being political activists and they will campaign. You're always going to have that. But nonetheless, that's a different thing from giving money directly to politicians. I'd, I'd be happy to kind of restrict that. But if you restrict that, then you've got to give the political parties something else because it costs a lot of money to, uh, to run elections and they shouldn't be... You should never have an election where one side outspends the other by five to one or Let's something. See. Virginia, can I give you an idea of just how silly and how porous and uh, dead ordinary our campaign finance laws are? Now, I don't know what was spent in this uh, weekend spent along by-election, but both sides threw everything at it. They were, both sides were heavily resourced um, in terms of personnel and dollars. But you and I will not get to find out what the major party spent or any of the other people on that ticket for perhaps another year. That's the current system, perfectly legal, but it could be up to a year before all that, that information goes in the Australian Electoral Commission site. Now, we've already got um, some pretty good moves underway across the states down the eastern seaboard. Queensland has got tighter laws, New South Wales has got tighter laws, and Daniel Andrews here in Victoria is promising the tightest set of laws of all next year. We will see. Quite frankly, it will amount to nothing um, unless Canberra takes action to ensure that there are nationally consistent laws across the country. Because if money is stopped at one source, it will go to the national offices. So what is required is for action in Canberra and comprehensively. Just before I move on, just very quickly, because we'll have to get to the other panellists, do you have a strong sense of yourself of, of what those sources exactly should be and shouldn't be? Well, if you look at, say, the Canadian model, I think they have a cap of about $1,500 from either individuals or entities. That's it, 1500 bucks. 50 individuals within one entity could give 1500 bucks each. That's, that's, no, no, sorry. $1,500 from an entity, so a corporation, yep. or from an individual, that's it. It's capped at that, right? And there is no third-party funding, no third-party campaigns allowed okay. in the election period or a period leading up to, the, up to the election. I'll come to the politicians in a moment. Alice Workman? I think that one of the big issues is inconsistency with reporting as well. So we need to... And the AAC's website, as much as I love the AAC, they do a great job. It's very difficult to search through and find who is giving money to whom and how much. So I think that definitely needs to be included in any kind of reform. And I think that pretty much everyone has agreed there needs to be reform in the area. Uh, do you like the sound of this, Greg Hunt? I mean, I can imagine the politicians blanching at the idea of the, all that money, those, uh, that river of money drying up. 
No, look, I, I've always been open to, uh, uh, to campaign finance reform, and I've, I've, this is not new, I've said this previously. There is an imbalance because you have an extraordinary flow of, of union funds. Uh, three things. One, uh, foreign donations, uh, we're moving to ban them. Two, uh, foreign influence, um, which we were already doing before the, uh, the Sam Dastyari issue came up, but that's almost unique in Australian parliamentary history, the, uh, the degree and the, gra the gravity of what was involved, and uh, somebody will be having to leave Parliament as a consequence, but not yet, obviously. For some reason, he's, he's still there. And then the, uh, the third thing, it's been my long-held public position that I am uh, in favour, so long as the third party issues that Over Maxine and that outlines is, that's the one. Are, are dealt with and this, the disadvantage and the risk is that you can have the unions and get up uh, play a role whilst the parliamentary parties had relative parity but inequality on the other side. So Greg, I'm open massive, to changes. We've, we've seen massive Hang dollars on, coming from the mining industry, from the bankers and all the rest of it. So in fact there's big dollars from both sides. It shouldn't oh. be beyond. It should not be beyond the wet. You just mentioned a terrific example. We are ending the year on an extraordinary spectacle of the Parliament coming together on an important issue of social mm. equality. Well, let's, let's, can, let's can there be no more other quickly. important issue than a bit of, and putting a bit of purity back into our democracy? Well, we now, have, would we, you support your leader coming back next year and grabbing this and putting it in no, the Parliament? No, I, well, I, I want to hear what Anthony Albanese thinks, Greg Foreign Hunt. influence laws Minister, which would be I'm a stop great you there. Anthony point for bipartisanship Sorry, immediately. Well, we, of course, have had legislation before the Parliament about foreign donations. We've had it, it's been defeated twice. Uh, I support campaign finance reform. I have for a very long time as an official of the New South Wales branch uh, going back to the 1980s I was arguing this case. In New South Wales uh, there's much better transparency. I think that's a key. Knowing who's donating and when immediately. It is absurd that uh, we had circumstances whereby people didn't know about Malcolm Turnbull's massive donation to the Liberal Party. Uh, due, until well afterwards, and it was forced uh, out of him for that to become public. That's an absurd situation. You should have caps on the amount in which uh, candidates can spend, and we should do this. It can only work if it's a bipartisan way, and if we deal with, third parties have to be dealt with as well, whether they be lobby groups like, like Get Up or what have you, or whether they be the biggest campaign that's been held in this country, of course, was the miners uh, campaigning for their own interests, putting uh, tens of millions of dollars into that campaign. OK. Let's go to our next question now, and it comes from James Hogburn. Recently, we've had uh, Sam Dastyari kicked out of the Australian Parliament because he uh, allegedly foolishly told a um, foreign national that he was being tapped by ASIO. Um, we've also seen on the weekend that um, a male has been arrested for um, doing the work of North Korea, allegedly. Um, what Do you think the Australian public are naive in, uh, in un their understanding of uh, foreign countries trying to spy on us? And what can the government do to stop these threats? I'll come to you first of all, Greg Hunt. I, I, I don't think the public are naive. I think the public are right on to this. Uh, they know when somebody's trying to game the system in Australia, whilst I individual cases of uh, uh, poss uh, possible espionage or uh, improper activity, I'm talking about the North Korean case, those will be with the security authorities. The, the public knows if uh, somebody's trying to game it. That's why they've been strong supporters, overwhelmingly strong supporters of uh, action on national security. Uh, I believe that they will be very strongly supportive of the, uh, the laws on undue foreign influence. Uh, I think that's why Sam Dastyari is going to have to leave uh, Parliament, because uh, it was an unprecedented action by a parliamentarian to tip somebody off about uh, a, uh, an alleged surveillance by the security authorities. Uh, unique and unprecedented in my view. So I think the public are uh, as alert as anybody to this and they play an extremely important role in keeping a balance but making sure that uh, Australians are vigilant. Greg Sheridan. Well, um, I really do think, uh, Virginia, that this is a very important issue and I think both sides of politics have got their rhetoric a bit, a bit wrong lately. I think the government overdid its rhetoric and I think Labor was wrong to, to claim that the government was China-phobic uh, 
this, should, this is not about China in any ethnic sense. The million Australians of Chinese background uh, first-class Australians, this is not about them. This is about a foreign government. We almost shouldn't call it China. We should call it the People's Republic of China government, the PRC. Go back to the old terminology. There is no doubt. Everyone in the national security establishment knows that the government in Beijing makes a massive effort to steal our secrets, to attack us with cyber weapons, mm. to uh, suborn and influence our politicians, to buy political influence, uh, to keep under surveillance uh, PRC citizens who are in Australia, whether they're students or others. Uh, there is an element of blackmail and intimidation of PRC students by the government in Beijing. Now, you put it all together, it's a very, very unpleasant thing. Now, what's new is that there are new methods of cyber mm. intrusion and new methods of financial intrusion, which are the the children of globalisation, if you like, and so we're dealing with a new situation. Other countries are dealing with it too, the United States, Canada, Britain, even New Zealand. Just to jump in, the question went to whether we were naive, whether we actually really had a grasp on all of this, in, in, of the situation that you describe. And it's exactly what I've heard at cyber security conferences as well, where, where those cyber attacks against Australian businesses are daily and are just expected. Do we fully comprehend that? I think our discussion has been a bit naive for several reasons. Uh, one is, quite rightly, responsible national leaders, government and opposition, don't want to offend the government of China, which is a very important trade partner for us. But that has made them mute and they haven't educated the public about a terrible reality. What you've seen increasingly is our security people, sort of through parliamentary committees and the like, telling the public what is the underlying reality. And they're only telling them Believe me, this is like an iceberg. They're telling them right. about 2% at the top of it. OK, let's hear from Matthew Albanese on this one. Well, I, I don't think Australians are naive. I think Australians are, are very conscious about our national interest and are also conscious about the fact that uh, foreign governments of various persuasions will try and influence the Australian economy and the Australian political system. <laughs> and uh, our national security agencies are very robust in the work that they do. I think they, they do a fine job and it's important they're able to do that free of uh, political interference or hyperbole. Uh, one of the big issues uh, that we dealt with in government was Huawei and whether they got the capacity to participate in the national broadband network. Now, we were very transparent saying that there were national security interests there. We didn't go into all of the detail and, and I think that is appropriate, that, that not everything uh, be out there. But we made it very clear on, on what was a critical infrastructure issue. Uh, I think that the issue of the, the Port of Darwin uh, is a big issue that uh, I wouldn't personally have... I, I think that should be an Australian government owns or, uh, ownership or Northern Territory government ownership. And I think there are key assets where we need to make sure that public ownership or by Australians, by the Australian elected governments, is maintained for those reasons. Um, we just go, I just want to go to, I'm going to go to James, uh, who asked our question, just for a quick comment, and then we'll come to Alice Workman. Anthony, if, it's not, if, if the Australian public aren't naive, why did it take so long for Sam to resign? He should have resigned straight away. Well, some of it, of course, with regard to... Sam Dashiari clearly made a grave errors of judgement and repeated, and it's cost him his political career. But let's also put some perspective on here. Everyone knew that the gentleman uh, concerned was uh, uh, under scrutiny because it was on the front page of every newspaper. Now, I don't know what happened in a conversation between two people in a house uh, in uh, wherever, wherever he lives in Sydney, but that issue had been on the front page of every paper for a long period of time. Oh, Alice Workman. James, I think that it's a really important question and I think the unfortunate answer is we're as naive as the government or security agencies want us to be because especially under the new national security legislation, which actually prohibits a lot of reporting on these issues. So if you look at uh, ASIO investigations, ASIO wiretaps, ASIO leaks, some of them are illegal to report on. You could go to jail as a journalist for reporting on them. So I think that it's really unfortunate that we live in a climate where the government doesn't trust journalists to do their job properly and give them the information that the public needs to know. 
and would rather kind of lock up this information and you know wait for a year, six months further down the track to let them know when they when the issue has resolved itself or died down. Okay. Maxine, for just very quickly. Uh, um, just something I'd draw everyone's attention to. Well, I thought it was very interesting. Not so long ago, the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Frances Adamson, actually made a speech which was very interesting. And she, it was a message to Chinese Australians and Chinese Australian students in particular. And she was saying, you shouldn't feel intimidated. Um, and it was a message to say that if they're getting the messages from the PRC and you know their other masters and all the rest of it about behaving in a certain way, coming out in the streets in support of Beijing, they should be making up their own minds. I thought it was a very interesting comment from the secretary as opposed to the foreign affairs minister. So it kind of it's an example of us actually, I think at a very senior level, the secretary department taking this issue head on. I, I, I applauded that. I, I think the wider issue though is that we are a bit naive or underdone on our overall foreign policy. And Hugh White has gone to this question in a, in a large piece in the, um, the quarterly. And he's basically saying, we still have the view that great and powerful friends like America will be there for us. Well, we're seeing in the United States withdrawing from, certainly from, from Asia. It is hard to see, even post-Trump, any other emerging American leaders who are going to embrace and engage Asia in the way that we've expected that in the past. Okay. Which well, means well, we are on our own in making some nuanced and sophisticated judgments about how we engage Those are with China. rather contestable propositions, Maxine. Mm -hmm. Well, do you, are, you, are you confident, Greg, that, it's, that America will remain engaged in Asia? I think it's absurd They to say suggest, they will. Well, if I can answer yeah, you. sorry. I think it's absurd to suggest that they're withdrawing. I'm not confident of anything Trump will do. I, I'm on the record of saying I think Trump is a poor leader for the Americans. But, but this alliance, this alliance and this relationship has been critical to our security for more than 100 years. So the smart thing for us to do is weather Trump and make the thing work. And they're still the most powerful nation in the world by a million miles, a million miles. Okay. And it's in our interest to keep them engaged. I thought Hugh's essay, which he's been banging on about for at least 10 years, was rubbish, but we have different views on that. <laughs> we have, we have, we have, <laughs> not that no, Maxine on that Lee, but we have some um, questions coming up in this general area. So remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, do let us know on Twitter and keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation websites for the results. Our next question comes from Abhinit Gupta. The systemic child sex abuse brought to light by the recent findings of the Royal Commission are of serious concern. But Melbourne Archbishop Dennis Hart insists that the seal of the confessional should not be broken, even if someone confesses to being a child abuser. Do you think that this right to confidentiality is worth preserving at the expense of justice? Greg Hunt, well, we'll come straight to you because, of course, the recommendations mm. are now ones for the government to pick up. What do you think? My honest view, as a father, as uh, somebody who... Uh, takes care of an electorate and uh, you see magnificent parents and, uh, and, uh, and schools and students is uh, if a child's life or health is in danger, there is an absolute duty that trumps everything else to take care of that. And that will be my position. Anthony Albanese, I'll come to you because this, this takes us, uh, we will all have you know, views on this, but it takes us into the difficult area of, of how much pressure can be brought to bear upon the Vatican. Well, it is a difficult area, but the, the whole area of child sexual abuse is difficult. That's why it wasn't confronted for such a long period of time. And when I look back at uh, the period in which we're in government, I think that Julia Gillard deserves absolute credit as Prime Minister for having the courage to make this decision. I mean, this is what Royal Commission should be for, not to uh, pursue political opponents, to make a difference to people's lives. <laughs> and there's something like 8,000 private sessions, 57 public hearings, all sorts of... Uh, of uh, people have been able to, to tell their story. And that's been important in terms of prosecutions. It's also been important in terms of changing culture, but there hasn't been enough culture change. And I think those institutions that have been responsible uh, for some of this abuse 
need a bit more humility, in my view, in how they've responded. Craig Sheridan. Well, look, uh, I think the Royal Commission did enormously valuable work. This is a gut-wrenching and terrible issue. Uh, it's the most confronting and awful thing. Uh, and as a Catholic, it's the worst thing I've ever heard about my church. Uh, I don't agree with the proposition that you break the seal of the confessional. The Royal Commission itself recommends that client attorney privilege be maintained for child sexual abusers talking to their lawyers. Now, they might tell their lawyer in dealing with three offences that, uh, that they're aware of three other offences. But the lawyer, under the rules of the Royal Commission, is not compelled to tell anybody about it because they believe there is a social value in lawyer-client confidentiality. Now, the truth is, not many Catholics go to confession these days. The whole point of confession is that it's anonymous. There are no real proven cases of actual child abusers telling priests uh, about it. Frank Brennan, who is the most law-abiding citizen in the world, says if this becomes the law, he will simply disobey the law every time he hears confession. This will do nothing to help abuse children, but it is part of what I think is quite an, an ugly uh, phenomenon of using this tragedy to prosecute an agenda to chase the churches out of the public square in Australia. You think he's just prosecuting an agenda against the church rather than actually trying to achieve some good if there was a confession made uh, in a confessional and there would be some protection for that person who was clearly breaking the law? Well, no priest uh, that I've ever met, and I've asked a lot of them about this, has ever had a confession of that kind. And I think nor... if, if memory serves, according to uh, hearings in the Commission, there was, there was at least one. But, but no, not, not, on, the, on that but, one case... But notwithstanding not, not that, on that it still, commission... uh, still is breaking the law and you're saying that's OK. No, well, it's not breaking the law at the moment. They're trying to, to change the law. But on that one case, the Commission did not refer to that case because it was not established that, that it was actually a fact. And, um, you know, anyone who's actually been an old-style pre-Vatican II Catholic knows that the whole point of confession was that it's completely anonymous. You go in, there's a curtain, the priest doesn't know who you oh, are. Oh, it's not anonymous. The priest doesn't uh, know who you are. No, he doesn't, I tell you. <laughs> when I used to go to confession, which is a long time ago, and I tell you what, I've got lots of things to confess. It was for me too when the priest knew who I was. Yeah, but that's because you're a pure, decent, good person. And you oh, weren't ashamed say. of and your And you went every Saturday, yes. didn't you? But, uh, Natch, but uh, let me tell you, the priest just, had just no quickly. idea who I was. Maxine McHugh. Um, look, I, I can't imagine that the Holy See uh, will be changing, you know, centuries of practice on either celibacy or the seal of confession on the basis of what an Australian Royal Commission says. And I do note, while it is certainly true that the, the huge bulk of accusations um, concerned practice um, by, within the Catholic Church, nonetheless, there were terrible stories in relation to um, the Anglicans, um, Salvation Army and others. And the issues of confession and celibacy do not apply in those situations. So these may be, you know, uh, I've, I've heard Catholic bishops say, in fact, that it's, it's time to put celibacy aside and all the rest of it. But it's not as, quite, quite frankly, it is not central to the issue of, of sex abuse. So I, I, I tend to think that the prominence that these issues have been given um, takes away from all of the other hard work that, in fact, you know, I'm sure you, the Parliament will be addressing in the new year and, and already has started okay. to go through that. And that is about the protection and respect for children. Yeah. I, I think it's also important to note it's not well, just though. religious institutions either. No, absolutely. Uh, Boy Scouts, there are a whole range of civil society institutions that were impacted by Yes, this. And, and the Commission was clear on that. Alice Workman. I'll leave it to the lawmakers to come up with the laws, but I think that one of the most important recommendations in there was the issue about the lack of women in the hierarchy in the church and that if mm. potentially there'd been more women around then maybe some of the horrible things that happened might not have happened or but going forward into the future if the Catholic Church does or any of the organisations that were named in the Royal Commission do reform I personally would love to see more women in positions of power. Okay. <laughs> Let's have a change of pace for our next question. It comes from Alex Eit. If you want our generation to be healthy, then where are all the bike paths? Because I don't like riding on the road, um, right next to the, all the cars and the trucks, and I'm sure I'm not the only person that feels this way. <laughs> Alex, thank you for your question. Alex is still in primary school. And this is an, 
An issue that matters to him because he has to ride on the road. Um, Minister, I'm going to come to you. Um, and Anthony Albanese is infrastructure, of course. But um, I know that the, the, the rules and the legislation is different from state to state and, and you, you share uh, footpaths in some places. But um, shouldn't uh, governments around the country be focusing on this? Well, uh, I, I think Alex makes two points, really. One is about bicycles and I think everything we can do. You know, I grew up uh, you know, riding bikes and uh, it, that's how I used to get to and from school. So the more we can do on the safety, incredibly important. Uh, the second point, Alex, I think right behind it all is this notion of getting young people into sport, into action, whether it's uh, walking, riding, whether it's running, whether it's netball, whether it's uh, uh, you know, football, whether it's AFL. That the more we can get young people in, they build life, lifetime practices of being engaged in physical activity. That's how we help win the war on diabetes. And so those are the big things. So you're absolutely right on bike access, but I think there's an even deeper point that you're making, and that is if we want young people to be healthy long term, we've got to give them the opportunity uh, to be engaged in sport and engaged in exercise. And it doesn't matter what the sport is, it doesn't matter what the exercise is, so long as they get the physical and the mental health benefits, then we'll have a healthy next generation. Anthony Albanese, where does this sit, sit in your infrastructure priorities? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's up there, and thanks, Alex, for the, the <laughs> suggestion. One of the things that you can do as a Commonwealth, a, a lot of this is local government and state government, but the Commonwealth is the funder. So the Commonwealth should make, and, and we did, as a pre condition of funding uh, arrangements for major infrastructure projects, active transport, that is walking, how people walk to the train station, how people uh, and access in terms of cycling. So things like here in Melbourne, the new regional rail link has really extensive bike lockups at new stations at Wyndham Vale and Tarnit. What that has done is change the way that people get to the train station so you have a, a double benefit, supporting public transport, but also supporting active transport. And that should be something that doesn't flow through as an add-on. It should be a part of an inclusion of any infrastructure project. Um, I know that um, Alice Workman really likes listicles, so um, uh, why don't we actually try and compose one here if we can, Alex Eit. Uh, what makes a really great bike path? Do you, is there one that's a favourite for you that, that really works for, for bicyclists? Um, well, I kind of like the one that's kind of next to the place where you walk because it's not next to all the parked cars where a door will open and yes. uh, you're about to crash into it. Yeah, which is a particularly Melbourne thing where they've been put right next to, next to the roads. Alice, uh, uh, Alice, do you ride a bike? No, I don't. Um, but I love this question, Alex, and you want to know why? You've accidentally stumbled onto one of the most politicised issues in the country. <laughs> now, you live in Melbourne, so uh, excuse me for this Sydney anecdote, but in Sydney <laughs> there have been huge issues where the New South Wales government have ripped up Clovermore, the Mayor of Sydney's bike lanes, because there's been an issue about who owns which part of the street. So the government own the intersections and the mayor controls the streets. So they had bike lanes, and this is not a joke, bike lanes that ran along the street, stopped, became a left-hand turning lane for cars <laughs> and just vanished. So the, bike, the bicyclist was left to kind of figure out how to get across the intersection. Bike lanes are hugely politicised and I find them fascinating. I live in Canberra, <laughs> we have a very peaceful life and we have a lot of them. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe everyone could look to Canberra, do what they're doing. Thanks, Alex. Alex, that's where you have to go to university in Canberra where you can ride your bike everywhere. <laughs> Our next question comes from Zoe Ranganathan. In light of Mayor Robert Doyle's leave of absence, could the Me Too movement be used as a political smear campaign in Australian politics in 2018, as seen in the US with uh, would-be Senator Roy Moore in Alabama? You see what was said about uh, Roy Moore as a smear campaign against him. I think that that's a, political, uh, that's a potential uh, way of seeing that, yes. Okay. Um, Maxine McHugh, I'll start with you. Mm. I don't like the idea of any kind of smear campaign. Um, so um, I'd say a definite no um, on that question. That is not to say that, in fact, um, there is well-deserved um, fury and momentum around the outing of, in what looks to be the cases of some outrageous sexual predators. But I've got to say, I have got a bit of a concern when people start running all the way in this direction and get ahead of steam up, 
um, some um, not so guilty people get caught up in it. Um, I happen to be appalled at um, the way Geoffrey Rush has been treated recently. He's been denied any natural justice. He went to the Sydney Theatre Company and asked to hear the allegations against him. He knows nothing. And good for him, he's now um, taken out legal action against the Daily Telegraph, which published stories against him. So I think this is, um, this is a tricky one. Um, I have every sympathy for those women who have been treated appallingly in the workplace. And you don't get to spend um, 30 or 40 years in the workplace um, in the media, as I have done, and in politics and in other areas, without having a few battle scars. And I'm not going to go into my stories tonight. But it worries me that um, campaigns and even talk of organised smear campaigns will get ahead of steam and will take all before it. We're, we're, Don't we're, like that one little bit. Where's the talk of the organised smear campaign? Well, sorry, this is this laid the question. Oh, you mean in, in the relation question, to Rome? The question I just said that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Alice Workman? I had a horrible realisation when the um, Don Burke allegations first surfaced because one of my first jobs in media, I worked at a radio station in Sydney, and one of the first things as a young university student that I was told was really casually, don't get within an arm's reach of Don Burke because he's a bit gropey. And in my head, I was shocked. But it was so kind of, the whole radio station kind of knew about it, accepted it. It was just a word of warning. I luckily never really met him. I only spoke to him over the phone. But um, I internalised that and unfortunately pushed it down and completely forgot about it until the stories came out a couple of months ago. And I was horrified. I was genuinely horrified. And I can think of hundreds of examples of people I know that have worked in the media that have had Me Too stories about a whole range of people from someone who had a thing of fried rice dumped on their head because their boss didn't like the job that they did one day to other people that have had genuine serious cases of sexual harassment. And I know that they exist in politics as well. And Tracy but Spicer Alice, Alice isn't that the point that in fact the very significant is being caught up with the quite trivial? I think that any case of harassment whether it's sexual harassment or bullying is all very serious. Yeah. And I think well, the problem, the problem uh, that I think, that's thing, sorry, I think the problem that we've had is that people have been told that cases, you know, whether they are as small as, as office place bullying, aren't serious. And that's why they've, they've, th they've learned to live with I think office place them. bullying is very, whether it has anything to do with sex or not, there can be a lot of bullying that has nothing to do with sex. There but can, I think there one can of be the male on male bullying and female people, on female bullying. People right. don't like talking about it. Right. It makes them uncomfortable. So they try and sweep it all under the carpet and convince people that it's not an issue when it is. In terms of kind of the, the Me Too stuff happening in Australian politics, I know Tracy Spice has talked about how she, she is investigating it at the moment and I'll be really interested. But there's a great story that I read today about the policies of harassment in Australian Parliament. And it said that um, if... The definition of harassment by the Department of Finance, who kind of overlook politicians, officers and staffers, uh, is really loose. It doesn't really exist. And if anyone is ever found guilty of any type of harassment, a politician or a staffer on anyone else in the building, there's nothing that can be done by the department about it. Because their policies are so outdated that they, they haven't caught up to what's happening at the moment. And I think that, you know, anyone out there that is wanting to come forward, solidarity, because I really think they should. I, I, I want to hear from our politicians on this as well. Um, Anthony Albanese? Well, I think that uh, the people coming forward have been very brave. And when you have, in Roy Moore's case and some of the others, when you have multiple numbers of people coming forward, then there's a clear case. But, uh, I mean, I take uh, Maxine's point as well. You need to... That there's a potential for a smear campaign against anyone without evidence. So it is important that there be natural justice. What's happened in the past, though, is that the power imbalance in workplaces and in society between men and women have meant that people haven't come forward. Mm. I think, I think the real problem, I think, uh, for a lot of women, and maybe this is where the, the, um, uh, you're coming from, Alice, is that um, the cry of natural justice now um, never seems to have been heard back in the day when so many women were harassed and bullied and pushed out of jobs and, and made to feel sure. uncomfortable. And, uh, but but the, 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 the retreat to natural justice for everyone else is sort of, has been so quick and immediate. Greg Sheridan. Well, Virginia, you know, a lot of the stuff that's being disclosed is unbelievably appalling and um, a bit it, it seems to be right across 
across the spectrum. But uh, let me offer you this kind of cultural political reflection. It's a good thing Roy, Roy Moore lost. He was an unfit candidate. It's a very interesting cultural moment in our politics, though. What Trump represents in part is the, the thrill of transgression moving from the left in our culture to the right. Remember the famous Alec Ginsberg poem, Go F Yourself With Your Atom Bomb and so forth. It was one of the first times the F word was used in sort of polite company. And this was a frisson of excitement in the society and gosh, the left were daring and so on. They used to use mm. bad language and baby boomer lefties loved to try to shock their parents. They spend their whole life doing it. From, and from now, beach poetry to Donald Trump, I would never have no, thought no, this no. is a thesis from <laughs> but, you, but anyway, but go on. No, well, you know, I think this is a very serious cultural point. Now, what has happened is that the, the right in America, and you can see a good deal of this in Australia too, now they feel that the establishment is the left and that the people who control the culture are, 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 are left of centre people. And the Hollywood uh, political culture and the New York Times, the Washington Post, all the rest of it, is a left of centre culture. So I thought Trump's odiousness meant that he would never be elected. Yes. But what has happened is that millions and millions of people who feel grumpy with the culture have said, actually, we enjoy being naughty. And they're learning the, the, the thrill of transgression that the lefties used to sort of pioneer 30 years ago. When you have a culture where both left and right enjoy nothing more than being rude to each other and, huh. uh, you know... <laughs> Establishing that they're odious Look, and barbaric. It's an interesting theory, but th th those transgressions, as you call them, or assaults or harassments, have been yeah, no, going for a long about, time. I'm not talking about physical assault or anything. I'm talking about otios, rude, sure. crass okay. behaviour. I want to hear from Mark Greg Hunt on this as well. Sure. Look, I think the key thing here is historically there haven't been what you might call safe processes where people felt mm. they could put forward their case. Uh, I think this is That's probably right. a point of very strong agreement between Anthony and I. Uh, Anthony mm. and I. Uh, and so to be establishing those, those processes where people feel they can put their case uh, and those who are accused also have the capacity to respond, that's a bit different from nat natural justice. It's just basic yeah. fairness, basic fairness, and it's a, it's a safeguard in the system. Mm. So I think that w might be what you're looking for, safeguards in the system. You've got to feel safe to put your case forward. You've got to feel uh, as if you can put a counter case uh, to make sure that... Uh, there are the very rare, I would say, very rare but occasional uh, cases of false accusation. But overwhelmingly, the problem has been uh, that women have not, women have not felt safe uh, or confident to put their concerns forward. And we're making progress. We haven't got far enough yet, and that's part of our parliamentary task in the next year. All right, let's move on to our next question. It comes from Alex Giannopoulos. Today, Scott Morrison cut $2 billion from university funding. Are we Americanizing our university system? And is our obsession with balancing the books taking precedence over access to higher education? We'll start with you, Maxine mm. McHugh, given you're in the university well, setting. Thank you for that question. I did notice that uh, the Prime Minister didn't um, mention the freeze on university funding last Wednesday or last Thursday or even you know, <laughs> Saturday. But Monday after the Benelong by election, we're going to have a freeze on university funding. It's just a coincidence. Oh, it's it's yeah. astonishing, <laughs> isn't it? We had to keep a fresh announceable for Monday. OK. This panel uh, so look, I, I think, it, you know, the, the poor old universities, um, considering that, you know, the Prime Minister's a Rhodes Scholar, best education, you know, available to him, and uh, he hasn't exactly been a friend of the, the universities. The universities will survive this. Uh, but it would be nice to think that one of the most important sectors, and a, a critical sector in Victoria, absolutely critical in Victoria, um, gets a whack here and a whack there and all the rest of it. The wider question is, and it's something that um, the university I'm attached to, the University of Melbourne, is talking about, and that is that is it not time for us to try and... We'll never depoliticise these things, but is it not time to think of something like having a Commonwealth Higher Education Commission which actually considers the long-term vision for all of our universities um, and an appropriate funding model. And into that, you might, might start to say, well, have we been well served by having more or less 40 universities that are based on the same model? Mm -hmm. Perhaps what we require, if, if we are moving towards a more deregulated model, then let's have greater diversity within our university sector so that students have got a lot more choice, genuine choice. 
Well, uh, Greg Hunt, it's your um, uh, government's policy, and you are from Victoria, this place where Maxime McHugh says universities are, are so important as well. What's your response? How do you defend the decision? Sure. So, um, <coughs> what was announced today was part of a, a, a mid-year budget update. Uh, there was two and a half billion dollars for new medicines and additional spending on Medicare. Uh, there was 1.3 billion dollars as part of the primary, uh, primary and secondary schools funding, the quality uh, quality teaching program, uh, and there's eight percent growth in university funding over the course of what's called the forward estimates or the period for the budget. Uh, so there is significant growth, but universities also have access to international students. They are increasingly able to attract uh, revenue for their activities. And so our Australian university sector is, is flourishing and they are a, an incredible international asset. The only question was, would we uh, invest the money in new drugs, uh, new medicines, new devices, things such as that, which we have done, a, a, larger, a, a larger amount than the change in the education funding, or would we allow them to uh, have access to international students and to do the other things where they have greater flexibility in their, in their revenue. So our, our university sector is flourishing. Instead, we're putting enormous amounts into medical research, uh, we're putting funding into primary schools, into areas which don't have as easy uh, an approach and a, as easy an ability to access other sources of funding. So Greg, Greg, funding up Greg, for universities, flourishing. funding up more for uh, medicines Greg, and medical the research. The sector has been in limbo for a couple of years because of inaction and indecision on university funding. I, I couldn't uh, disagree more respectfully. I have and you don't blame the Senate, I have, Senate, I have <laughs> great, great respect, but uh, what you're seeing is growth in the number of students, growth in the university sector, a $1.5 billion profit in the university sector uh, in, the, uh, in the last year, a strong, clear, uh, a strong, clear part of the economy. And we're backing the research side, we're backing the school side, we're backing the medicine side, and that was where we made the choice around the balance of okay. responsibilities. I want to hear from Greg Sheridan on this. Well, look, I think it's perfectly reasonable to stop the uncapped, uh, you know, infinite demand. So if you want to do a degree in you know, Foucault's critical insights, insights into macrame making or something, the, the taxpayer has to pay for it. That's just bananas. Very few countries have that. That's a cheap shock, Rick. It's, sure. Yeah, well, no, what do you expect? And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> look, the universities, first of all, Melbourne University could triple its enrolment tomorrow. It will never have any trouble filling up every place that's available to it. But an uncapped uh, system is a foolish system. We have declined in trades training and technical training, which our workforce desperately needs. That's why we've had to in, import all these four, five, seven tradesmen. But we train people. Uh, the, you know, the state of the humanities in, in most universities is wretched, uh, dominated by loathsome French critical theory and of no use to anyone, least of all the undergraduates mm. who have to suffer through the appalling uh, course material. Uh, any, this, any, this is not enough. Anyone here do a degree in French critical theory yeah, and want yeah. to defend that position? This, this <laughs> cut is not nearly enough. As usual, yeah, the, yes. government, uh, the government is uh, neither Arthur nor Martha. There's a yes at the back. Uh, look, uh, Greg Sheridan has introduced the issue of TAFEs and, of course, um, you know, some are seeing the, 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 the rise or the need for the cap because, of course, Labor, you know, back in the day wanted to see, I think, was it 40 per cent? Uh, that young people, 40 per cent of young people came away with a bachelor degree. Looking back on that, do you see that now at the expense of TAFEs? Uh, no, um, but what we do need to do is also look at, at TAFE and to... There's been a crisis, essentially, because you had the private sector come in uh, and set up these organisations that haven't delivered quality training. And, to be frank, both sides of politics are in part responsible for that. I'm not just blaming the current government. I think that we made some mistakes uh, when we were in government as well. But with regard to universities, what we're having here is we've had legislation. It's right, the higher ed sector has been in limbo for a couple of years because the legislation hasn't been able to be got through the parliament. So what the government did today was say, well, we won't worry about getting our arguments up through the parliament. We'll come through another way that doesn't need legislation that gives us the same amount of cuts, the $2 billion in cuts. Now, if we're going to compete in this century, we have to compete not on the basis of low wages, which is where we're headed, but on the basis of how smart we are, on innovation, 
on universities as well as uh, advanced manufacturing, as well as making sure that we have that technical sector in education also looked after. Sure, but, but if you're in government, you'd have the same budget um, demands and problems uh, to balance. The cuts we, have to be somewhere. We, we, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be giving a tax cut to the big end of town, to mm -hmm. big business that is going to occur. We, we would have kept the levy on those above $180,000. We wouldn't have cut that. It's a matter of priorities, and the priority should be the way that you can grow an economy is by investing in infrastructure or investing in people. Right. We'd do both. Alice Workman. To go back to the question, it's fundamentally an ideological difference, isn't it? So the government have decided that they rather would collect the money that they want to balance the budget than to actually ask the sector what they wanted. Because they started off with full fee deregulation, which everyone in the sector, from academics to unions to students to the higher education section of the Australian, everyone universally said it was a bad idea. So they dumped full dereg and they went to partial dereg. They couldn't get that through the Senate. So what have they done instead? They figured out a way to, to bypass the legislation system and to make the cuts anyway. I think the one thing to remember is that uh, they're putting in a performance mechanism for the way that this freeze is going to work. So it is going to hold universities to account for the, the jobs and the outcomes of, of graduates. So you'll be able to know before you pick a degree, what the likelihood of you to get a job out of it is and, and what your earning salary is, which I think is pretty important, especially if the government are going to lower their help repayment, which they want to, but, you know, that's legislation and given the past few Senates okay. they haven't been able to get it through, I don't know if they will, but, yeah. All right, let's go to our next question from Maria Baranova. Uh, my question is for Greg Hunt. And uh, historically our healthcare system was set up to target common diseases. Uh, in terms of cancer, it's bowel, prostate, breast and lung cancers. Uh, they get uh, priority funding and uh, showing great improvement in survival rates and development of screening technologies. But according to Rare Cancers Australia, just in single 2017, over 52,000 people in Australia will be diagnosed with rare or less common cancers. And, um, 25,000 people will die, uh, which is about 50% of all cancer death. Uh, these people neglected and discriminated by the system, and uh, they have very little in research funding, and they almost have no access uh, to medication. And my question is, um, how do you plan to improve research funding, medical access, and screening technologies for people with rare and less common cancers? Sure. Thanks, Maria. I think this is a really important question and uh, it, it, one of my passions since coming in has been focusing on rare cancers and rare diseases. We've announced under the Medical Research Future Fund a, a new program, a rare cancers, rare, rare diseases clinical trials program and a zero childhood cancer initiative. Uh, tomorrow, by chance, I will be uh, uh, going to Peter McCallum and we're uh, making new announcements in the rare cancers space, uh, specifically uh, for some of the things that you're, you're talking about. And we've announced uh, the Australian Brain Cancer Mission. And this is a $100 million uh, commitment of uh, public and, uh, and philanthropic funds. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've met with many people who are suffering terrible conditions. One of the most powerful was meeting a little girl, Ellie, who was 12 months old. Her parents had given up hope because there was a tumour spreading across her chest. The program, the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, sequenced the DNA. It was a, a last roll of the dice. That found that she had a rare genetic mutation. There was an international consortium that was looking at it. There was a drug that we were able to source. And that little girl, that little girl on the day that I was visiting in hospital, came off the ventilator and when I was back at the Sydney Children's Hospital a few weeks later, that was the day she went home. And uh, what you've identified is that every Ellie, every Ellie has to have a shot at having their cancer and r their rare condition treated. And that's my goal in my time in this role. Minister, I know the announcement's tomorrow, but um, at, at the very least, could you mention a few of the rare cancers that will be covered by the, the, the funding announcement tomorrow? Sure. So the sorts of things that we're looking at uh, all up. Uh, we deal with uh, different types of pancreatic cancers and lymphomas. These will be over a series of announcements mm -hmm. over, the, uh, uh, over the coming months. So it's not just tomorrow, but there are a series of announcements. 
Uh, you find that many of the blood cancers are, are difficult. The, the brain cancers are catastrophic and particularly target uh, young children. Um, and then uh, we have not been successful in uh, dealing with pancreatic cancer. It's, it's got a terrible survival rate. Uh, it's been a Rubik's Cube that the whole world has failed to crack, but we want to be at the forefront of that. We want to be at the forefront of the, uh, the blood cancers and the lymphomas. And ovarian cancer as well? Uh, yes, yep. Uh, we uh, are very involved with uh, ovarian cancer. So all of these are incredibly important. And only last, uh, only last week we announced a new uh, cervical cancer uh, uh, assessment process which should have a 30% increase in the lives saved from it. And uh, that's perhaps one of the most important things that I'll ever get to be involved with. Thanks for that. Uh, we only have time now for one more question this year. So the final question for 2017, no pressure, uh -oh. is from Daniel Elkington. In recent Australian political history, we've seen a politician worried about the government controlling its citizens through grammar, a politician, <laughs> a politician worried about not spending too much time on marriage because of the crocodiles, <laughs> and a Prime Minister spotted eating an onion. <laughs> Let's face it, Australian politics is really, really funny. <laughs> is it only outlets like BuzzFeed that cover this properly by accepting that Ozpol is, at its heart, a great big free comedy? <laughs> <laughs> this one's for you. <laughs> Alice, is BuzzFeed doing the ABC comedy channel out of a job? Oh, gosh, I hope not. Uh, Daniel, great question. Daniel runs a very excellent uh, Twitter account, which uh, if you DM me, I'll tell you what it is because he probably wants to remain anonymous. But, um, uh, <laughs> a bit uh, late now. Right. <laughs> Back to camera. I don't yes. reveal my sources. I don't reveal my sources. Um, <laughs> Uh, don't, don't take us there, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Australian politics is hilarious because, honestly, you've got to laugh because if you don't laugh, you'd cry. Um, <laughs> but I think that, uh, you know, our business model shows that you can show the lighter and the more serious side of things. You know, you can report on, you know, what ministers are doing when they're misleading parliament and you can write a listicle about, you know, who are the best-looking politicians in the building, which I haven't done but has been done in our workplace. Two, so. two of them are here, obviously. Well, yeah, <laughs> clearly, I mean... Uh... Two, of the, two of the funniest. Do, do you like the idea of being the butt of the joke, Anthony Albanese? I think you've got to have a sense of humour in politics to survive, frankly. And uh, I often get, uh, get into trouble from my own side, as Christopher Pine does on his, for us sort of joking with each other. Um, behind the scenes, you've got to have a laugh. And uh, next year, Greg Hunt, uh, more comedy or a little more serious? <laughs> well, no, Anthony, Anthony and I are doing a karaoke the, couples after tonight right. uh, <laughs> with, the, with the whole audience. Uh, no, look, it's always, a, it's, always a, it's always a mix of... Uh, you've got to be able to feel the, the lighter side of it and then retain the sense of purpose. So a great friend of mine said to me, uh, take your work seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. And uh, that's a pretty good uh, approach to life. It's... That is a nice approach. It's just a quick comment, isn't it? So, Virginia, the wittiest politician I ever knew was Bob Carr, and I used to think his wit would get him into terrible trouble in politics, and astoundingly, it didn't, whereas wit and humour gets a lot of politicians into trouble. It's good to have a laugh. That's right, we should. But I've finished the year with one serious point. I've been a journalist for 40 years. I've met politicians all over the world. Our politicians are certainly as good as the average politicians anywhere in the world, all of them start out trying to do some good for their country. They're much more idealistic, I think, than the average, uh, average run-of-the-mill person. They actually have a dog's life, although they're all volunteers. They don't, they don't deserve any particular sympathy. But I do think it is corrosive and bad to think that there's something wicked about our politics. Our politics is basically good, and we have been a very well-governed country throughout our history. And here was I thinking that he'd be the <laughs> Christmas is. Grinch tonight. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. That is all that we have time for tonight, so please thank our marvellous panel, Maxine McHugh, Greg Hunt, Alice Workman, Greg Sheridan and Anthony Albanese.
Q&A Extra on Facebook Live and News Radio to catch Scott Wales and the airport economist Tim Harcourt. They'll have a post-match review of Q&A and they'll take your calls and comments. We are back in February 2018 to tackle the big issues and the huge political year ahead. We hope that you are taking a break over summer too. I look forward to being back in 2018 and Tony Jones will be here of course too. Thanks so much for watching and participating in Q&A this year. It's been marvellous having you. Until 2018, from all of us here at Q&A, good night.